these people are having Zoom calls or texting conversations with their doctors about when they can get on their schedule for them to come and kill them. It is so disturbing, so disturbing. And so rather than encouraging these people to live life to its fullest, to find the deeper meanings, to ask themselves what life was asking of them, to find a way to make their lives mean something more, Canada is telling people, you may as well give it up. You may as well let us, let us kill you. Amir Fasud is a Canadian with chronic debilitating back pain that happened as an accident. And so he can't work much and he's on medical and governmental aid in Canada. And his funds were running out. He couldn't get the care that he needed. And so at some point along the line, he became aware of a program in Canada called MAID, Medical Assistance in Dying. And he applied because his back hurt and he was gonna run out of money and they weren't giving him the help that he needed. And he was gonna be homeless. At least he thought he was gonna be homeless. And most of all, he was hopeless. So a miracle happened for our Amir. City News in Canada got wind of his story and they came and interviewed him and released his story on the news. And an anonymous person named Effie started a GoFundMe for Amir right after this show aired. And within a few days, they had raised $60,000 from people all over the world for Amir. And they actually stopped, they actually shut the GoFundMe down because he was afraid he was going to have too much money to continue to qualify for the financial services that he got from the Canadian government. Well, City News went back and did a follow-up interview with Amir. And these are some of the things that he said. He said, I am a different person. The first time we spoke, I'd wake up every morning and I had nothing but darkness and misery and stress and hopelessness and all of that. And now I have the opposite of all of those things. If the story hadn't piqued your interest, he's talking to the reporter. If you hadn't come here to do that story and then people, including Effie, hadn't seen it, I'd be dead. Because by the time this second one aired, six weeks after the first one, he was scheduled to have have his life terminated through MAID, through their legal euthanasia program. He qualifies for MAID because of his disability and his physical pain. But now, after the airing of these two episodes and after um, receiving all of this money, he put his application away. He said, the people who are using MAID are the people that society has deemed throwaways. And if society can't be bothered to give them the dignity of life, then I guess at least they're trying to give them a painless death. He said, I wouldn't have thought that this would be possible. The kindness, the humanity, the compassion that I saw in the last month and a half, I didn't think it existed anymore. So in 2016, Canada passed a legal euthanasia program called MAID. And when it passed, it had all of the restrictions that you and I might expect in something even approaching an ethical euthanasia program. You had to um, be chronically ill and there was no way for you to be made well and your death had to be very eminent, I think like within a year and your pain had to be completely unmanageable and you had to have multiple doctors sign off on this. Well, in just the past six or seven years, it has accelerated to be the most aggressive euthanasia program in the world. 
after a while, they released it to um, those that were chronically ill, but their death wasn't imminent. And then in 2021, they opened it to multiple ailments with chronic pain. And the numbers skyrocketed from 500 to 10,000 people. And numbers are just coming out for what happened in 2022. In fact, when I first heard about this program and started researching it probably three or four months ago, it was in queue that in March of 2023, it would become legal for people with mental illnesses to apply for and receive MAID, which sounds so sanitary, which is legal suicide, basically. Um, and I mean, I'm sure you can just imagine all of the layers of nuance and complication that that entails. And I have read story after story after story of people who one young man, um, has a debilitating disease and he's starting to go blind and he, he was in despair. And so he applied for maid and he was, um, approved and his mother found out about it. He was in his early twenties and she actually called the doctor that approved his application and posed herself as him and recorded the entire conversation and exposed this doctor. I mean, these people are having Zoom calls or texting conversations with their doctors about when they can get on their schedule for them to come and kill them. It is so disturbing, so disturbing. And what's happening is that, you know, when all of these people gave money to Amir, more and more people in the world became aware of just how this unethical path that this was headed down and um, became concerned, just like Amir said, that it was the downtrodden and the most vulnerable people in society that were subject to this. And in fact, there are multiple reported cases where, okay, so for example, I've seen several uh, tracked this specific story that there was a veteran with PTSD and brain, uh, some brain injury who called in to, of course, we know that Canada has a socialist medical system. And that is one of the things that's playing into this. And so, um, he called in just for services for veteran services for himself so that he could get some help for all of this, you know, emotional, physical pain that he was in. And the person on the phone said, well, do you just want to apply for maid? And you can imagine what a vulnerable situation this veteran was already in when he called in and now it's being suggested to him. I mean, imagine what those words mean to the person on the receiving end. You are basically saying your life is worthless. You may as well end it. And so it is so disturbing. And what I want to do in the next few minutes is I don't want to, I mean, I have done so much research and, um, I want to simply give you a couple thoughts of my own that I've not seen in most of the things that I've read and watched about this. And I want to have a conversation about those things. And then I want to, um, give you some resources so that you can continue researching and reading about it. If that's something that you would like to do, there's a lot of links in the description to videos and articles that I've read. And, um, one of the books I would really recommend that you get is denial of the school of the soul by M Scott Peck. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more about why that that's a good reading for you. So there's a really awesome movie that I love. I think the actress in it is Geraldine somebody. It's about Mother Teresa. And you know, she, her work was to care for the dying and to um, give them whatever care they could receive, get them well, if that was possible, and then to care for them as they died, if their death was, was eminent. And so there's this really beautiful scene near the end of this movie where a reporter comes in, he's been there before. And he's trying to understand why Mother Teresa does what she does and why she doesn't just let these people die or in, you know, in the, the Canadian terms, just put them out of their misery, just execute them um, with maid, you know, give them, give them a shot. And um, 
there's a man that's really ill and Mother Teresa is hand feeding him. And this reporter says, you know, is watching this happen. And the man looks at the reporter and he's waving his hand and he's kind of mumbling something as he's eating. And so the reporter says to Mother Teresa, what is he doing? And Mother Teresa says, he's, he's blessing you. And the reporter says, oh man, I could, I could buy up him and all of these people in this whole facility. And Mother Teresa says, you couldn't buy his blessing. And there's kind of one of the points that I want to make. One of the things that I want to say about this whole conversation and the reason the title of this video is that it's coming to a town near you is because there's already, I think, eight or 10 states where some kind of euthanasia law is on the books and, and people are, are utilizing it in Canada. They've adopted some of the original laws that went into place in Canada in the early back in 2016. They've, they've incorporated some of those laws. Other states are looking at them. And this is going to be something that is going to come into the United States. Maybe you're not in the United States. I don't know, but Wherever you are, your country probably has some laws and it's becoming more and more of a worldwide conversation. It's going to become more and more of a conversation in the United States. You need to know what you think about it and how you feel about it. And you need to vote accordingly. And you need to have some, some conversations with yourself, with God, with your family about what this means, um, and, and what really is ethical and, and, it's so important that you understand that this is fundamentally a moral issue. It is not just a medical issue. It is a moral issue. And in the early days of, you know, the euthanasia program in Canada, it was like, well, if you're going to die really soon and your pain is totally unmanageable, you know, then, then we just need to do this and you can opt for it. And I even struggle with that unless you're just screaming in pain and they've given you every possible thing that they could possibly give you. Um, maybe there are just unbelievably extreme exceptions to the rule, but there's an element of human dignity. There are so many countless stories of people rising above their circumstances. And I'm going to share a couple with you in a minute and, and, and an even deeper issue around this that it's important to think about. But I think you need to know that you know, I'm telling you this, it sounds, I know it sounds almost inc it, like incredible, like impossible. How can this actually be happening? Like I haven't even heard about this or whatever. You, maybe you're saying that to yourself, but I promise you, I have, I have done the research. You can go to Canada's pages on, I have read the documentation, how you are eligible, how you apply, how you're approved. Like it's all out there. The numbers, the stats of how many people are taking advantage of it. And they keep climbing. Like it's all out there. And there are people who actually defend it. There was an article, um, I've got it in the description for you by Richard Hanania. He says, Canada has perhaps the most permissive euth euthanasia laws in the world. So by defending MAID, so this article is about him defending MAID, I will defend all other systems against attacks that they go too far. And in effect, I will argue that no nation in the world goes far enough in making assisted suicide available and convenient for those who want it. And one of the things that he gets right is that it is at its core, a moral question. And for him, we just ought to let everybody die that wants to. And I'm sure it has a lot to do with, you know, overpopulation and, um, feeling, uh, he, that he's superior in many ways, you know, the ego and all of that stuff, I'm sure. But to say that it's medical alone, to say that all, just think about, just think about the person who is deeply depressed. Now you're going to, you're going to help. You're going to say that they are in an appropriate state of mind to decide whether or not they want to die and to just give them, you know, give them a lethal injection and they're gone. I mean, going back to the story about this young man. So the mom records the conversation, exposes the doctor and actually stops her son from receiving maid services from, from being, um, 
killed. And then later, and this is, I think I put this link in the description also, he, the, he's interviewed <laughs> in this article. And you know what he says? What do you think he would say? You're right. He says, I'm so grateful. I'm kind of upset with my mom for intervening in my life choices because I'm an adult, but at the end of the day, I'm doing better, I'm feeling better, and I'm glad I'm still alive. Because that's what's going to happen, right? That is what is, that's what's going to be re the result so much of the time. I want to share um, a couple stories with you as we wrap up that demonstrate that we can always rise above our circumstances and that they're, that this is the questions of life and death are what give life some of the richest meaning. And they are the things, and this is why this book is called Denial of the Soul, because M. Scott Peck believes that when euthanasia laws become, I mean, anything above like absolutely eminent death, excruciating pain, that we are denying that there is a soul that needs to be nurtured and grown and that the question of death and dying is something that nurtures the soul of the person that is dying and the person that is attending to them. And that it is meant to be an opportunity for personal growth because we believe in an afterlife, because we believe that that soul is going to go somewhere and that death has been given to us as part of giving life more meaning and part of helping us to grow beyond our circumstances. So this is a beautiful story just about rising above your circumstances. I'll briefly um, quote, this is Jordan Peterson. He gave a beautiful, if you've not seen it, a beautiful speech at the Hillsdale uh, commencement a year ago, maybe such a beautiful address. And he tells the story of this woman, which I'm going to really condense, but basically she's a street person. Um, she has ratty winter jacket on. She's really dirty. She's really stooped over. She looks much older than she is. She's really mentally ill. She's timid and humble. People shy away from her. She can't communicate very well because she's very shy, but because English is not her first language, he thinks she's probably in the lowest, ten, in the, in, in the lowest, like below 10 percentile of intelligence. So she's not very smart at all. Her mom is um, very ill and bedridden. And she has a boyfriend who is a violent alcoholic schizophrenic who is always haranguing her and somewhat abusing her. She's not very attractive. And she just has this unbelievably difficult life. He says that she is the downtrodden of the earth in the realest sense. So she had been at this behavior clinic that he was at this day that he met her. She had been an inpatient. Uh, she had been a patient in this clinic before. And he said it was such a rough place, so cold and dismal and ugly that when his brother just walked through the clinic one day with him, it was traumatizing for his brother. And this woman had been an inpatient in this facility for quite a while and been released. And so then he says this. She had been in the inpatient ward for some time and was then released. She wanted to talk and she had returned this day that he was there to see her. She had returned because she wanted to talk to the hospital administration because when she was released, she had gotten a dog and she took care of this dog and she really liked this dog and she took good care of it and took it for walks. And she had come back to the clinic that day because she wanted to see if she could find an inpatient who was worse off than her and she could take them for a walk with her dog to help them feel better. And he says, you know, when you meet someone like that and they just have nothing, they have nothing in the world that you would recognize as any marker of success or status or ability and they're outcast and tortured. Nonetheless, this woman in that dismal state was able to rise above her own catastrophe, which was manifold and find someone worse off to try to serve. So when you tell someone they're better off dead in virtually any circumstance, you totally devalue any worth that they had. And this woman would seem like the person least likely to be able to give anything in the world. And here she was 
finding a way to serve fe her fellow men, finding a way to help them. There's this story in Man's Search for Meaning, which I love, and we read in the Academy where he talks basically about... <laughs> Uh, he says it was a very strict, so this is Viktor Frankl. He's in, he's a Jew. He's in a concentration camp in World War II. And they have a camp rule that forbade any efforts to save a man who attempted suicide. So if someone tries to kill themselves, you're not allowed to stop them. So they had to put all their efforts into helping people stay alive. Now look, if life didn't have worth to the very breath why would anyone in a concentration camp try to encourage anyone else to stay alive? It's because life under any circumstances is better than killing ourselves. And so he says, um, I remember two cases of would-be suicide, which bore a striking similarity to each other. Both men had talked of their intentions to commit suicide. Both used the typical argument. They had nothing more to expect from life. In both cases, it was a question of getting them to realize, and this is the point I want to make, that life was still expecting something from them. Something in the future was expected of them. We found, in fact, that for the one, it was his child whom he adored and who was waiting for him in a foreign country. For the other, it was a thing, not a person. This man was a scientist who had written a series of books which still needed to be finished. His work could not be done by anyone else any more than any other person um, could ever take the place of the father in the child's affections. He goes on, this uniqueness and singleness, which distinguishes each individual and gives a meaning to his existence, has a bearing on creative work as much as it does on human love. With the impossibility of replacing a person is realized. So this kind of, we talked about this a little bit in the creating video that you are irreplaceable. And if you're still breathing, there's probably something that life expects of you. There's something that you have to give. There's something that's uniquely yours to contribute. It allows the responsibility which a man has for his existence and its continuance to appear in all its magnitude. A man who becomes conscious of the responsibility he bears toward a human being who affectionately waits for him or to an unfinished work will never be able to throw away his life. He knows the why for his existence and will be able to bear with almost any how. And so rather than encouraging these people to live life to its fullest, to find the deeper meanings, to ask themselves what life was asking of them, to find a way to make their lives mean something more. Canada is telling people, you may as well give it up. You may as well let us, let us kill you. So one last story I want to leave you with, um, the Hiding Place, one of my very favorite books in the whole world. If you don't have my book, The Mission Driven Life, and you haven't read The Hiding Place, please go to The Mission Driven Mom, grab my book, grab The Hiding Place, and read them together because you will see that you can be anywhere in your life and you can have any problem that you currently have and you can overcome it and transcend it and go on to bless the world in meaningful ways. And so you'll see the work that they did in the hiding place and you'll see how they became those people in my book. So it's really, really awesome. Personal growth is always available. We can always make a choice to do a creative act, to serve someone. And this story absolutely proves that this is possible. So the 10 Boom family is incredible and go read those books so you can know all about them. But the mother had spent her life in service and to her community. She had done a myriad of things, which I talk about in my book. And then she'd had a stroke and it had left her incapable, basically of moving or talking. So she's basically a vegetable. And I've just got to say, I've watched some things, especially around abortion debates. And I've heard some young people talk about how if someone is in a vegetative state, they, you should just pull the plug. And I'm just saying these people have not been around on the planet long enough. They have not lived long enough. They do not know what they're talking about. So she's here. She lays unconscious for two months. Okay. She lays unconscious for two months 
and they take turns taking care of her. And then one morning, as unexpectedly as the stroke had come, her eyes opened and she looked around her. Eventually, she regained the use of her arms and legs enough to be able to move with some assistance. So all she could really do was stand enough to sit down somewhere else. So she couldn't really do hardly anything. She couldn't write or crochet or knit or really walk around. She didn't have to completely be carried, but all she could do was basically lie in bed and get up. And that's basically what she did. She was either in bed asleep or they would get her up every day. They would help take care of her and they would sit her in front of the window in her room. Okay. And, um, but her mind was clear and active as ever, but she never got the ability to speak with the exception of three words. This story is so amazing. She can say Corey and yes and no. Okay. So I'm going to read you the rest. So mama called everybody Corey, <laughs> which is really sweet. That's her daughter's name to communicate. She and I, this is Corey talking, invented a little game, something like 20 questions. Corey, she would say, what is it, mama? You're thinking of someone. Yes. Someone in the family. No. Somebody on the street uh, you saw on the street. Yes. Was it an old friend? Yes. A man? No. A woman mama had known for a long time. Mama, I'll bet it's someone's birthday. And I would call out names until I heard her delighted. Yes. Then I would write a little note saying that mama had seen the person and wished her happy birthday. At the close, I always put the pen in her stiffened finger so she could sign it. An angular scrawl was all that was left of her beautiful curling signature, but it was soon recognized and loved all over ha Harlem. It was astonishing, really, the quality of life she was able to lead in that crippled body. And watching her during the three years of her paralysis, three years, I made another discovery about love. And this is what I want to leave you with because we are capable of love until the very last breath we draw. And so this, my argument about euthanasia, the thing that I want to say about it that I don't think is being talked about enough is the warmth of a human body in the room. You know, if you have ever deeply loved that you don't care about the quality of life of the person that you love, you just want their warmth in their body next to you. You just want to feel them and touch them and their look is enough. Their presence is enough. Mama's love had always been the kind that acted itself up, acted itself out with soup pot and sewing basket. But now that these things were taken away, the love seemed as whole as before. She sat in her chair at the window and loved us. She loved the people she saw in the street and beyond. Her love took in the city, the land of Holland and the world. And so I learned that love is larger than the walls that shut it in. So please educate yourself about MAID in Canada, about euthanasia in general. Know where you stand with it. Fight for laws that are appropriate to the human experience, that reflect a belief and a knowledge about the value and the quality of the human being and the soul, about the need for us to prepare for another realm that we're headed to in the afterlife. And please, um, Share this with people that you know and love so that they can be aware of what's going on and they can utilize the resources that are down in the description. And like I said, if you want to know more about the 10 booms and their amazing contribution, you can head to the mission driven mom.com and grab my book and get a copy of the hiding place, but please do your homework, know how, what you think and believe about euthanasia and be active in your community to make sure that something like what's happening in Canada doesn't come to the United States.